Well, greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York. Beautiful day here at the site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Welcome to our program, Virtual Voices of the Game. As always, brought to you with the generous support of the Ford Motor Company. We thank Ford Motor for their uh, help with this, allowing us to do programs throughout the spring, summer, fall, and winter of 2021. And we're very glad to have with us today uh, someone who has had one of the more eclectic, one of the more varied careers in baseball. His name, Rob Nelson, perhaps best known as the founder and CEO of Big League Chew, but he's also a former minor league pitcher, lifelong baseball fan, general entrepreneur, has had some tremendous experiences over the years. Rob, this is the first chance that I've had a chance to interview you. I know you've been to Cooperstown a number of times. We've never crossed paths, but uh, thanks for being with us. Welcome to the program. How are you doing? Well, it's it's my pleasure. It's a sunny day in Portland, Oregon, and uh, it just feels like baseball. And I'm just really happy to be invited to your show. This is very cool. Portland. Wow. Far away. Didn't know you lived there. I mean, obviously you pitched there for many years, but didn't know that you lived there. We'll talk more about your Portland connections. But one of the things I want to do with Rob right off the bat is talk about his early days as a baseball fan. And I've heard you on, um, you know, other podcasts, uh, the, the Sabercast that you did with Rob Nyer a while ago. And you talked about being a young fan and going to games at this place. Oh, well, the place, Polo I Grounds. I wish could have gone to the Polo Grounds. Yeah. The horseshoe-shaped stadium. Tell us about this. Well, you know, the Mets were brand new when I was 13 years old, 1962. And my dad was NYPD at the time. He was an officer. And uh, I said, Dad, I've got to go to opening day. Uh, they started on the road and they came to New York. It was midweek in April. It was a drizzly day. And my dad said, OK, you can do it. Take school off. And my friend Billy Lukasik and I went into Manhattan. We were out on Long Island, about 40 miles from the city in Massapequa, south shore of Long Island. And my dad he said, Rob, I don't think they're going to play today. His windshield wipers were going. And he said, if it rains, go see a movie. I'll pick you guys up at five o'clock. I mean, we're talking 1962. So parents could do that. And I said, Dad, they're going to get the game in and we, and we have to go. There were maybe 12 or 13,000 people at the game, uh, April of 1962. And uh, I was hooked on the Mets from that day on. I mean, they, the, the ballpark was was so unusual i think it was 258 down the left field line 262 down right and uh, it was forever i don't know almost 500 feet up to where the clubhouse was in dead center field where willie mays made that famous catch in the world series but it was a wonderful ballpark it was a wonderful day the the team was hodgepodge they you know they they won 40 games out of 160 that year so they were the likable losers uh, but, but, I, but I was hooked. I mean, I having said that I was a big Whitey Ford fan. He was a lefty. I was a blonde lefty, you know, probably 140 pounds. I wanted to be the next Whitey Ford, but the Mets were plenty good for me. And to go to the polo grounds and see a ball game and a piece of history, it was just nothing quite like it. Quite. I got to see a couple of New York Titans football games before they became hmm. the Jets and moved over to Queens. And the, the AFL was brand new in the early 60s. That was a delight as well. Probably fifteen or 20,000 people watching a pro football game in uptown Manhattan. So, yeah, the, just to look at that photo brings back a rush of memories. Great stuff. Rob, do you remember what section? Were you in the infield, more toward the outfield in the polo grounds for that opening game in the Mets history? Out in the left field, upper deck, mm. there were oh, three or four gentlemen smoking cigars Whenever I smell a cigar now, I think of the polo grounds. I just thought, wow, this is the real deal. Guys having a beer, smoking a cigar, and, and watching the Mets in the rain. Yeah, we were in the upper left field. If I remember right, they had a player named Frank Thomas yeah. uh, who hit a home run. I think maybe he hit about 35 home runs that year. He was a dead pole hitter. So the speculation was that he could hit 60 in the polo grounds because it was smaller than a high school field, frankly, you know, down the left field line. And I, like I said, I think he hit in the middle 30s in terms of home runs. But he hit a home run that game. The Mets, if I remember right, lost by one run. It's against the Pirates. Clemente played. I mean, it, it's pretty phenomenal. I mean, we're talking almost 60 years ago for me. And yeah. 
that I, the fact that I remember the cigar smoke and and, and Frank Thomas, it's the brain is a wonderful thing. <laughs> you remember the things that matter, you know, it's pretty funny. The ballpark shape has always intrigued me. I don't think I've ever seen another ballpark look quite like this horseshoe. Did you ever go to a game and sit in the center field seats? You know, that would be like sitting in Long Island or on Long Island. <laughs> sorry. Uh, it was really 500 feet. So I never did sit in the bleachers. Yeah. Uh, although I will say this, we sat out there when we saw a Titans game. We sat, you know, in the end zone section, which, of course, were the bleachers, but not for a baseball game. I mean, it was it was so odd. It was an amazing compromise to fit baseball and football there. And the truth of the matter is it didn't work for either sport. You know, the football yeah. field was miles away from the side, from the fans. And, and in baseball, the sidelines were just wacky. Last question on the polo grounds. Did you have any idea that this was a ballpark in its final stages? Were there signs that it was crumbling in front of you? Yes, I think so. I, I think the plan always was for the Mets to move out to Long Island somewhere. And, and of course, there was Flushing Meadow. There was the World's Fair. And, uh, and so Shea Stadium was born. I've just finished reading. Uh, the book Stealing Home about why the Dodgers move west. And one of the reasons was that, that Walter Melly didn't want to have a ballpark in Queens where eventually the Mets ended up. So it's fascinating to me. But in terms of the polo grounds, it was it was a museum and it was a museum on on its way out. In today's world, they might have renovated it the way they did with Wrigley and the way they did with Fenway Park. Yeah. But I don't know. I think the quirky nature of the architecture uh, lent itself to to demolition, sadly. Yeah. But I'm glad I got to be there. Grew up as a, as a fan of the Mets, but your two favorite players that you liked for very different reasons were not members of the Mets. That's right. You have both of them Hall of Famers. Nellie Fox was toward the end of his playing career, second baseman. And I love the baseball card here. He's a second baseman and coach simultaneously. <laughs> and then, of course, you have Whitey Ford on the right. Now, the reason you like Fox really had nothing to do with his playing style. It was simply his first name, right? Well, you know, I was a blonde, skinny left-hander, and I loved the way that Whitey Ford pitched. And my dad was a big fan of the game, and we would watch on a black-and-white TV just the chairman of the board doing what he did. So I emulated his, his pickoff move to first base, his mannerisms, the way he walked off the field. And my big brother, Harry, uh, and my dad were big baseball fans. And, and they would just obliquely make reference to the fact that this is how you do it. This is how a gentleman plays baseball. You couldn't tell after a ball game if Whitey Ford had won or lost. He was just such an even keel guy. And uh, he was just perfect for that team. He was the chairman of the board because, let's face it, those teams in the 60s were just chock full of great talent. And he was one of the, the main cogs in that wheel. The fact that he got to pitch to Yogi Berra and Elston Howard and uh, just things about him. Plus, my body type was about the same. In terms of pitchers, I worship Sandy Koufax, knowing that I could never do what Koufax did. But Whitey Ford, maybe five foot 11, 175 pounds. I said, I could do that. And so I've always worn number 16. So you like Ford's pitching style. But then with Fox, it was his first name, Nelly, right? Absolutely. Uh, my yeah. two brothers, my two older brothers, Ed and Harry and myself, we we're always called Nelly. Uh, I guess that happens when you're a Nelson. And uh, when I f got a baseball trading card and saw that there was a real Nelly Fox, uh, I was just enamored with that. And it's funny how when you're a kid, you do things for the silliest reasons. I started using a, a Nelly Fox bat, which if you broke it, you could heat your home for the winter because the handle was so thick. It was just a huge piece of lumber. Yeah. And my, my, my brother Harry used to say he could hit with either end with this bat. And so I was a left field hitter and just just going for singles the way Nellie Fox did. I learned how to bunt with that big handle bat. And uh, and again, there was just something about his mannerisms, too. I mean, he's in the Hall of Fame. The fact that he ended up with the Astros instead of the Mets was kind of too bad, you know, at the end of his career. But uh, pretty cool thing to, for, yeah. to be to be known as Nelly. And, and I think there's probably a part of me with, with, uh, with Nelly Fox that he always had that water red man in his cheek. And when I was 11 or 12 years old, I really didn't know what he had in there, but I would stuff my mouth with bubble gum pitching in little league in Massapequa on Long Island. And I wanted to have that look of Nelly Fox, you know, in, in terms of my facial thing, 
the yeah. form and everything was all whitey. We were lefties and, and there that was. But but Nelly Fox, uh, I think that might have been the first time it ever occurred to me that bubblegum would play a role in my future. Hmm. Pretty funny. Yeah. Did you have a chance to meet either of these Hall of Famers? You know, I never did. Whitey Ford used to go out to the east end of Long Island and dine at a place called the Lobster Inn. My brother Ed was a school teacher during the academic year and a bartender there in the summer. And our big brother Harry, who got to play minor league ball with the Yankees, uh, was the maitre d' and and helped run that operation. It was a wonderful place. And I would show up to work as a dishwasher or a busboy and they say, you won't believe it, Whitey Ford was in last night. So our paths never crossed, mm-hmm. which was really a shame because uh, he really is an idol. I mean, he, I miss him already, you know, with his passing. Uh, I, I think maybe Jeff Idelson told him that number 16 on the original pouch of Big League Two is in Whitey Ford's honor. And uh, mm-hmm. I hope he knew that because he really meant a lot to me. Nellie Fox, no, I never got the chance to meet. I met Bill Veck once, you know, his owner when, when Nellie played for the White Sox, but I never met Mr. Fox. Yeah. Well, appropriate that you met Veck because you have a lot of the same innovative streak, I think, in your character that Veck had. Let's talk a little bit about your days as a young pitcher. Now, this photograph's a little bit later from early 70s. But I presume you pitched in high school. You were a left-hander. Tell us what kind of a repertoire you had. I threw mostly breaking balls, and I threw them for strikes. And that's what gave me some success at the high school and collegiate level. Uh, I pitched for Burner High School in Massapequa. Their one and only baseball coach was Don Lang. When the town expanded to two high schools, Mr. Lang was in his early 30s, and he got the job as varsity coach. And when the school shut down because of population shifts, He was still the varsity coach. I think he was there for 42 years. He was an amazing man. He was a minor league catcher, and that really helped me a lot as a high school ball player. Because we had two high schools and our our school was brand new, it was kind of like the expansion draft. So there was a bit of a dilution of talent, and I got to be a starting pitcher as a sophomore. And a big help that Mr. Lang did for me was that back then on Long Island, if uh, you'd play a three-game series, let's say against uh, uh, Uniondale, and Monday and Tuesday and Thursday, and a lot of the high school teams would throw their ace on Monday and then on short rest on Thursday. And as a sophomore, Mr. Lang let me pitch against the top dogs on the other teams because I was the Thursday pitcher. So I would have six days rest and my confidence and a great infield behind me and uh, a great catcher, Tommy Green, uh, behind the plate. So I got to pitch at a level probably higher than I should have because Mr. Lang realized that the repertoire I had really matched the defense that he had. And so that started everything. Uh, My sophomore year, I ended up losing the Nassau County semifinals, a 13-inning game on my own throwing error to uh, Lawrence High School, Artie Brown, who ended up being a big star at NYU. And I'm talking about, you know, 1965. We're talking about 55 years ago and i still remember fielding the bunt throwing it into right field so you'll live with those losses you know but things turned out okay i I made all county my senior year uh went off to marietta college a d3 powerhouse at the time and was teammates with uh kent to i Mm. got to pitch briefly and i have to admit ineffectively for marietta as a freshman the highlight was the freshman game i pitched against ohio university their cleanup hitter was mike schmidt and fortunately for me, he hadn't learned how to hit yet. So I ended up winning against OU. That was the highlight of my freshman year. And then I transferred back to Long Island. I spent a year at Nassau Community College. Again, pitched briefly and ineffectively, but still loved the game. We were lucky enough to have a left-hander named Charlie Niffin, who was a great pitcher, probably a dozen years in the minor leagues. He took us all the way to Grand Junction, Colorado for the Junior College World Series. And then my grades were good, and I threw well enough in the Atlantic Collegiate League at St. John's University in the summers where uh, my coach, Al Goldis, convinced Ted Thor and the coach at Cornell that academically I could cope and I could get Ivy League hitters out. So Mm. I ended up going from a community college to the Ivy League. And I'll tell you, it felt like being called up to the Yankees to walk onto that campus and know that I was going to get a chance to pitch at Hoy Field where this photo was taken. Uh, it was a dream come true. Yeah, I, I just I only had one good year there. My junior year, I was marginal two and zero. My senior year, 
Uh, I was six and two. I shut out Princeton, shut out Penn, got hammered by Harvard, but I had a great time there. And I still have a lot of friends from the late sixties, early seventies from my Cornell days. It's pretty amazing. I love the Cornell uniform, the pinstripes, and looks like a pretty fancy logo on the right sleeve there. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm trying to think that might have been the 100th anniversary of Cornell or something like that. Uh, because Cornell baseball, I know I went to the alumni game. It was the 150th anniversary of Cornell baseball from, I don't know, 1869. So maybe that's what that was. I, I don't have my glasses on, so I can't tell. But I love the red pinstripes. The CU on the cap was also on the, on the, uh, the front of the jersey, like the Yankees and why. Ted Thorne was my coach and just a delightful guy. I mean, it was back in the day when he was the freshman football coach, when college teams had freshman football, and he was the varsity baseball coach. And he just gave me a chance because other people he trusted said that Rob can get hitters out. And truth be told, I just I probably never broke, I don't know, 82 miles an hour, maybe. It was all relative to me, and I just had a boatload of confidence, and I could throw double play balls and pick runners off first base. But Coach Thorin really, he set the table for me. And I have to say this, when I overheard two guys talking in the someplace else tavern in Ithaca, New York, about baseball in South Africa, I didn't say anything to them because they were talking about a job opportunity over there. But the next day, I went to Coach Thorin's office. I said, what do you know about baseball in Cape Town? And he said, Rob, I can't believe you're here. This job is perfect for you. Long story short, I ended up pitching in South Africa for about five seasons. Uh, I taught at a private school. I still hear from those kids there. It was middle school, and those kids are almost 60 now. But it really set the table for me because we won the national championship two years out of the five I was there. I got to throw a lot of innings. And the funny thing is when you're in your middle 20s, you think you're better than you are. My dad sent me some sports clips from the uh, – from the sporting news. And there was one article I couldn't get my eyes off of that said the Portland Mavericks were an independent team playing single A ball in the great Northwest. Anybody can try out. So when the season was over in South Africa in April, I went back to Long Island. I did some substitute teaching to make enough money to get to Oregon and flew out here in June of 1975, thinking I'd be here for three months and, and maybe get a chance to, I really thought I was going to go to the Northwest league short season win 10 games in half a season, and the Yankees would pick up my contract. But, of course, that, that didn't happen. I came out here, and I got, I got hit like a piñata. I really wasn't good enough as a professional player. As luck would have it, not only did Coach Thorne get me from Cape Town to Portland, but then I got to meet a Dartmouth guy named Bing Russell who owned the Mavericks. It's probably better known as the father of the actor, Kurt Russell. Yeah. But Bing and I really got along, and he kept me on the team for three years, I ran the Little Maverick Baseball School. I ran the tryouts. He said, you can help this team, but probably not on the mound. And he was he was absolutely right. So it seems like everywhere I turned in terms of baseball, there was somebody out there, whether it was an Al Goldis in the summer league or Mr. Lang in high school, Ted Thorne and Bing Russell, they all gave me an opportunity. And it was because I wasn't very good with the Mavericks that I spent a lot of time in the bullpen just thinking about ideas, shooting the breeze with my teammates. Most importantly, of course, my teammate, Jim Bouton. And that's where the idea of Big League Chew came from. Yeah. Big League Chew was invented because I wasn't a very good pitcher. And I had a lot of time to think about, as one of my teammates said, you know, Nelly, you think about too many things that don't matter. I'll never forget him telling me that. And Bouton was in the bullpen that night and he turned to him and he said, hey, Butch, how would you know? <laughs> how you know it wouldn't matter? Rob's all over the map. So, yeah. I'm a very Rob, lucky left-hander, I will say this. We're going to spend a lot more time on the Mavericks and your creation of Big League Chew. Just one follow-up question on the Cape Town experience. Was this an amateur team, or did you receive money to play there? No, it's strictly amateur ball, but it was the best they had over there. There were some teams that paid some of the premier players, but when I went over there, I played for a club called the Varsity Old Boys, and it's where I learned that the word varsity is a de derivative of the word university. Because the varsity old boys and an old boy is a graduate. So the varsity old boys were all graduates of the University of Cape Town. So VOB became a baseball powerhouse. But they needed pitching. And so I ended up there. And they helped me get a job at Hertzley, a school. It was a delight teaching at a private Jewish school in South Africa. When I did the interview with the headmaster, 
uh, Stan asked me, the headmaster, how do you feel about coming to a, working at a Jewish school? And I said, I grew up on Long Island. Half my friends were Gottlieb and Goldberg and Pasternak. I said, this feels like coming home. It was a delight to be there. It was really quite amazing. In the mid-1960s, you have a very interesting experience. Your brother is actually a player with the Binghamton Triplets at the time. Right. They're franchise affiliate for the New York Yankees. And right. you apparently had a chance to travel with the team, got to know the manager, Gary Blaylock, and a number of the players, too. You know, it was Harry signed, my big brother Harry signed just before the free agent draft. It was 1965. He had four or five offers. He would pitched at Wagner College uh, on Staten Island and threw very well. Although I will say his last year, the, the team was three and 15 and Harry was three and five. He won all their games. I saw him pitch at Van Cortland Park. He struck out 20 guys against Manhattan in a 10 inning game. And my dad and I couldn't believe that he lost. But it was his love of the game that got me hooked on it. And then when he ended up signing with the Yankees and then going to Binghamton, you know, maybe four hours or less from Massapequa, I got to go up there in that summer and travel with the team from Binghamton to Geneva to Batavia. What's fascinating is like back to the future, because along that Route 17 route is where the big league shoe factory is now in mm. little Akron, New York, maybe 10 miles from Batavia. So there's just this one giant loop. But Mr. Blaylock, let me throw batting practice. I mean, I'm a 15-year-old kid, never pitched behind an L-shaped screen before. I didn't know which side to throw off of. But they just treated me like a rock star. And another thing about being in Binghamton, it was my first really experience to be in upstate New York for a prolonged period of time. And that's what got me hooked on the idea of going to Cornell. So it's funny how baseball has had an impact that it's just in and out. Uh, in the background and sometimes in the forefront that baseball had an impact on me. My brother pitched well for Binghamton. The picture, the photo you've got there of Tommy Chope, he got to play a bit with the Yankees and then with the Orioles. And when they would come into town, my brother would go visit them and they'd go out to dinner after the game. And he just said, so great to see a buddy make it to the show. And Harry never did. He got injured and he had a long career in academic and uh, in real estate business. But baseball, it was our life and, and connection to just about everything. And, and Binghamton was a part of it. That photo of Tom Chope is probably from 1974, 1975, when he's with the Orioles. He looks yep. like he's a member of the Beatles or maybe the, uh, the Monkees <laughs> with Davy Jones. I'm sure he had much shorter hair when he played in Binghamton. He was a pretty good player. I mean, he made the Orioles late 60s, early 70s. And as I recall, was a backup on those postseason teams, at least a couple of those years. You know, he, my brother Harry used to describe him as Paul Blair's caddy. You know, when, when Paul Blair needed a couple of innings off, they put Tommy in the outfield. I think he was maybe 5'8", five, 5'7". Five, mm -hmm. He could hit well. The thing I remember about my brother's teammates is how kind they were. And not only to me, but I mean to the fans and everything. And so fast forward to when I got to play or travel with the Portland Mavericks, uh, that stayed with me that that be kind to the fans who are out there because you know, you're no big deal. You know, you love the game and you're lucky you're getting paid to, uh, to, to play baseball. And I learned that a lot from my brother and, and from his teammates that they were genuinely decent guys and funny as can be. And so I'm grateful for that. It's great to see this photo of Tommy Chope. I've never seen this particular shot, but it, he does look like the drummer for the monkeys. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about Blaylock. Now, he looks very stern in this photograph, but I imagine he was much different in terms of the way he treated you. He was certainly kind to me and very kind to my big brother. He knew Harry knew the game. In fact, when Blaylock got tossed out of a game, he made my brother the manager, <laughs> which is, you know, high praise because back then you got a pitching coach and, and a bus driver in you. So when you get tossed out of a game, you got to pick somebody out. My brother still keeps in touch with Gary Blaylock who I'm guessing is in his 90s now wow. and lives in the Midwest. He, he had a long career as a manager. He was a player back, you know, in his day kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, I remember the one story Harry had told me was that back then the New York Penn League was a long season and the, and the triplets had won the uh, first half championship. And I think they were in, I want to say Geneva. I might have that wrong. Wellsville maybe, but they, they were out at a club called the three o'clock and they came in late to the hotel and Blaylock was waiting for them in the lobby. 
know, that they'd clinch the pennant and he fined everybody. And then he never picked up the fines. He was just so happy for the guys. He had to, he had to put on the brave face sometime, but for the most part, he was a cubby bear. It's a pretty nice guy. So your brother plays in the minor leagues, and eventually you would get a chance to go to exp- uh, extended spring training. This would be in the early 1970s, and here's a guy that you met along the way. Now, some people will know who this is. Other people will not. But his real name, Randy Poffo, these, these are kind of imagined faux cards that people have made on the Internet. He didn't actually have any major league cards because he was strictly a minor league player. But Randy Poffo was a catcher. He played for a number of minor league teams, number of organizations. But that's not how he would become known as a celebrity. Tell us more about this man. I was knocking on doors in the spring of 1972, and as luck would have it, the Sarasota Cardinals had a manager named Bobby Dews, D-E-W-S, Southern gentleman, and I knocked on the door and, and, and asked for a trout, and he gave me the chance. And, and I'm warming up in the, in the morning in Florida, in Sarasota, and it is hot, and I'm thinking I'm throwing really well, until he said, all right, son, crank it up a little bit. And I realized I was out of gas. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had nothing left. So uh, uh, so Bobby Dew says to, to the catcher, Randy, move over a little bit. I want to see if he, what his control is. And so he moves to the outside corner, and I crank up, and I throw a hard slider. But I don't tell Randy it's going to be a slider because I want them to think I just have a late-moving fastball. And I remember his glove jerking a little bit to catch the ball. And I remember him nodding his head to the skipper saying, that's a pretty good pitch. So he threw it back to me, and he said, all right, throw that again. I cracked up. I did it again. And they said, how do you hold that pitch? And I showed him as if I was holding it like a fastball. He said, well, this kid's a bit raw, but we'll give him a shot. So for 23 days, May 1 to May 23, Randy Poffo and I were teammates. Randy, obviously, I never made it. I got released in three weeks. But Randy never made it as a ball player either. But, of course, he became Randy Macho Man Savage. And entertained a lot of people and was by all means a really good guy uh, up until his unfortunate early passing. He was in his 50s when he died. But I will say this. My biggest memory of Randy Poffa was me in those inter-squad games and extended spring training. And I'm getting hit like a pinata. And Randy's job is to come back and give me a new ball because one had just been deposited over the left field fence. And he said, you're doing okay. Keep the ball down. Snap that curveball a little bit harder. He never said, why did they sign you? I always remembered him as being a kind guy. And I only found out maybe 10 years later that Poffo was, in fact, Macho Man. And I would see the pictures and I'd say, does not look like the left-handed hitting catcher that I knew. But I was happy for him. And yeah. again, just part of my kind of my brother Ed says it's a, kind of a Forrest Gump kind of life that I've lived. I've traveled and just met the most interesting people. And fortunately for me, most of them have been really nice. And, and Randy's one of them. Interesting progression of photos here. You see him in the Reds organization. They've always uh-huh. been very strict, short hair, no oh, mustache, yeah. no beard. Then he goes to the Cardinals. We start to see the hair get longer, the size. Oh, scruff here, yeah. <laughs> and then later with the Cardinals, I mean, he's starting to look like a rock star at this point. <laughs> well, he was. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Did he talk to you at all about wrestling? Was this an interest that he brought up? He never did. I, I did a little homework on him. His dad was a pretty well-known wrestler back in the 50s, hmm. maybe early 60s, in the Bruno San Martino, Haystacks, Calhoun era. Hmm. So when Randy's baseball career went south, I'm sure his dad knew a guy who knew a guy. Because not only did Randy wrestle, but his brother, uh, Leapin Lanny Poffo. Right? I describe Lanny Poffo as the Washington generals of professional wrestling. Somebody had to lose. And that was Lanny. And he got his head handed to him, but he was a professional. He was, a, I think he wrestled longer than Randy did, but it was their dad who gave him th- that influence. And, and I love the fact that, that there's a brother to the thing. It's like Cal Ripken and Bill Ripken. You know, they're both good guys. One's in the Hall of Fame, but the other guy had a damn good career. You know, the Ripper was there for 12 years in the big leagues. Yeah. And Lanny Poffo is like the player to be named later or the brother to be named later. Uh, 
So I wasn't surprised to learn about that because I just liked the guy. It's pretty cool. Randy became one of the big stars in wrestling in the, I guess, late 80s, early 90s. Yep. He ended up marrying uh, Miss Elizabeth, I think is her name. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, they had a celebrated marriage. Unfortunately, it did end in divorce. And then, as you mentioned, you know, he, he died relatively young. He was in his 50s, I believe. It was an undisclosed or undiagnosed heart ailment. He suffered a heart attack while at the wheel. And just a, a terrible tragedy to uh, a guy that had this larger than life personality. You know, it's interesting to me when it happened and I read about what the cause was. It reminded me of Pete Maravich, that nobody knew that Pete Maravich had some heart issues as well. And you, you would think somebody of that stature in terms of pop culture or in terms of Maravich, in terms of professional sport, that somebody would have known about it. But regrettably not. But yeah. Randy made a lot of people happy. And, and I'm, I was grateful to be a teammate of his. It just kind of adds to my wacky mosaic of my travels. So you don't stay full time with the Cardinals. You're, I guess, cut after extended spring training. But later in the 1970s, you sign on with this fascinating independent franchise, the Portland Mavericks. Uh, tell us about how you signed on, how you met Bing Russell. He had been a a Hollywood star. He was in Bonanza. He was in a number of films. Uh, he was known, I guess, in particular for doing uh, Westerns, cowboy roles, but he did other roles too. Tell us about that, that first meeting with him and how you came to sign your contract with the Mavs. It was one of those things that when I went to South Africa to play baseball, after all options to play here were done, I got the teaching job, I'm pitching on the weekends, and, and I'm doing really well. You know, I'm in my middle 20s and it never occurred to me until I was like in my middle 40s why I had such success in South Africa. There weren't many left handers and there certainly weren't, weren't many pitchers who could throw breaking balls behind in the count. So I went from averaging two strikeouts a game at Cornell to like 12, 14 strikeouts a game in South Africa. And mm -hmm. I thought maybe I'm a late bloomer. Maybe I'm the next Warren Spahn. You know, Spotty didn't make the big leagues, I think, until he was like 27 or 28 years old. So as luck has it, has it, my dad sends a lot of sports clippings to me when I'm uh, in South Africa. And there was one article from the Sporting News that said the Portland Mavericks are an independent single A team. Anybody can try out. And I can remember having breakfast with another team, another American teammate, Dwight Lurie. Our season was winding down in April. He said, Rob, what are you do in the offseason? Uh, because my teaching uh, experience had had ended. And I said, well, I'm going back to the States, but I'm going to go out to Oregon and try out for this team because uh, I want to give it one more shot. He said, God, that's a great idea. Good luck kind of thing. And so I went back to Long Island. I did a month's worth of substitute teaching uh, uh, in, in Suffolk County and then got on a plane, didn't know anybody in Portland and landed at I don't, fantasy land. I mean, it felt like a Disney movie that the people were so nice that the stadium was awesome. And I try out, I throw three innings and strike out five guys. The next day, the newspaper said kid comes all the way from South Africa. looks like he's going to make the team. Three days after that, I pitch again and I get my head handed to me. I just got tattooed. And I remember the next day going to Bing Russell and who owned the team. And they said, Bing, I know I've just pitched myself off the team, but I'm going to stay in Oregon. I like this place. And I'll, I'll throw batting practice. I'll park cars. Uh, I'll sell tickets for you. But I really want to be a part of this team. And, and he said, OK. And, and I did all three. And then I had this thing I had written when I was in college. The idea was a baseball day camp where a minor league team would use public land and coach kids during the day because they played baseball at night. And Bing allowed me to use his brand. I created the Little Maverick Baseball School. Half the guys on the Mavs made more money working for me at my baseball day camp than they did playing for Bing Russell. I still see those guys. Some of us have all stayed around Portland, and we always laugh about that. That One fellow, to, uh, Bob Shortell, went to St. John's, came west in a similar dream uh, of mine. But he said... I had two jobs when I came to Oregon. One was pitching for Bing and the other was working for you with those kids over at Grand Park. I mean, it's, it's just quite phenomenal. But Bing gave me those opportunities because he knew I loved baseball. He was a Dartmouth guy. In the beginning, he told me later on, he said, you know, 
when I heard you'd gone to Cornell, I thought you're like one of these spoiled kids, like on like a, a one last fling tour of the summer. And then you'd go be a stockbroker or something. And then you found out my dad was NYPD and I went to community college before I played in the Ivy League. And so we became fast friends. He was just a wonderful guy. And he gave me every opportunity he could. Kurt was on the team the last year. And that family is just an absolute big league family. I, I just couldn't get over. There he is. There's Kurt right there. Yeah. Pretty amazing. But this to this day, this has to be early 60s, this photograph. That's right. Uh, Candlestick Park. You can see yeah. uh, Kurt is a young kid, young boy with suspenders. Uh, McCovey <laughs> goes down to his knees so he doesn't tower over the kid. Uh, looks like he's just signed a ball. Uh, just just tremendous uh, to see, you know, two celebrities at different stages of their careers. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Let's talk about Kurt and what he was like when you first met him. Um, I don't I mean, I. I've obviously been a big fan of his uh, uh, in terms of the movies that he's made. I mean, he 1980, he made one of the funniest movies and very few people talk about it. It's called Used Cars. It's hysterical. It's a great movie. Um, Can I say first, something about Used Cars? Sure. Used, car, used Cars is based on a true story in Portland, Oregon. There were the Tonkin brothers, Marv and Ron Tonkin. And they really didn't get along, apparently. But mm -hmm. some screenwriter got a hold of it and said, this would be a really good comedy and embellished it dramatically to the point that the Tonkin brothers sued the production company and said, you can't put that out there. Most of that is not true. I said, well, no, we don't even mention you guys. Nobody knows who you are. But Kurt is so funny in used cars and Jack Warden playing both of the brothers. It's a hilarious movie. Yeah. <laughs> He's done so it's many funny. Roles. That's the first one you bring up. I love yeah. that film. He's done comedy. He's he's done dramatic roles. He was terrific as Herb Brooks, uh, the U.S. Olympian uh, uh, hockey coach, 1980. He um, was Herb Brooks. He was amazing in that movie. Yeah. I mean, he can do just about any genre, horror, sci-fi, comedy, drama. Uh, what's his personality like? What When you first met him in the 1970s, um, he wasn't a huge name at that point. I mean, he was somewhat well known as a Disney star. But what was it like just talking to Kurt Russell, meeting him for the first time? You know, it, it was like the two big rock stars on the Mavericks were Kurt Russell and Jim Bouton. And both of the guys had commonalities. They loved baseball. They loved hanging out with the guys. Traveling on an old red school bus with those guys, it, it, was, it was wonderful. I can remember being in Bellingham, Washington. I had a hitch with Dean Hinchliff a relief pitcher, Kurt Russell and myself, and we got a ride in a pickup truck. The Mavericks were such a bad behaving team. We had to stay 11 miles outside of the town. So we had to hitch into town to get breakfast. So the three of us go in there and we go into a diner and one of the waitresses, well, this is the summer of 77. One of the waitresses says, one of the cooks says, one of you guys is famous. And Kurt says, well, we're the Portland Mavericks. We're here to play the Bellingham Mariners tonight, you know, <laughs> and he wasn't trying to be ironic or he just said, we're just having breakfast. You know, we got a, we got a game this afternoon. And I just love that about him. He was just, he was just the most gracious guy. I'll say this about Kurt, that same road trip, August of 77, Elvis Presley dies. And few people mm. know that Bing Russell was trying to put a consortium together to buy the Chicago White Sox and move them to Portland, Oregon. And Elvis was one of the financial guys behind it. Kurt's first movie was a TV film called It Happened at the World's Fair. And he's nine, maybe 10 years old. His only role is to go up and kick Elvis Presley in the knee. And you can find it, you know, somewhere on the Internet. Yeah. Uh, but so we're having it was that day we had the breakfast. We're having we're waiting uh, to get our ride. And Dean Hinchliff says, that's really too bad about Elvis. And then we were just talking about the impact that Elvis had on, uh, on pop culture, on America and so forth. Kurt never told us that he knew Elvis Presley, mm -hmm. that he'd worked with Elvis Presley, that Elvis Presley, in fact, had been in touch with Bing Russell because Elvis liked the way Bing wore his cowboy hat. And Elvis got a lesson from Bing Russell on how to wear a cowboy hat because Elvis was going to do a movie. I think maybe, I don't remember, Rio Bravo. I don't remember what it was, but 
he called. I found that story later at. It was Bing who told me that story that Elvis Presley called and said, Mr. Russell, this is Elvis Presley. I need some help on how to wear a cowboy hat. And Bing thought it was a crank call, but it really was the king. But Kurt never told us any of that stuff. He's just absolutely the real deal, just as humble as can be. His mom still lives in that house in Thousand Oaks, and I visit her about once every year or two. And it's just amazing to walk into a home that so, so much greatness came out of it. And, and, and yet, when I, when I saw Kurt at Sundance, when they, when they mm. premiered the, the documentary about the Portland Mavericks, the Battered Bastards, uh, before the curtain went up, I asked Kurt, what's the film like? Because it was his nephews who, who made the film. And he said, Rob, I don't know. He said, they interviewed me and they interviewed my mom. But these guys made this film, this, this movie with their own visa cards. And like that was the Russell way. I, th I think about that now. When I told Bing I wanted to start a baseball day camp where I throw batting practice for 10 bucks a day, it was like it was like the secret handshake in the Russell family. This is the way we do things. So when Kurt's nephews, the Way brothers, made that movie, Kurt lent his support in terms of being interviewed and, and production stuff that, that he knew, but but he never bankrolled the thing. Mm. And when he told me, I don't know what the film is like, I haven't seen it. And then the curtain went up and we're in Park City, Utah at the Sundance Film Festival. And the movie plays out 80 minutes of joy. We get a standing ovation. There were five or six Mavs there, including Kurt. And, and, when, and we felt like the Rolling Stones. It was amazing how people treated us. And then we were up on the stage and people for the Q&A. And, and somebody asked Kurt the question, you know, what was it like to see your dad up on the screen? And Kurt choked up. He said, you know, this is the first time I've heard my dad's voice since he passed. Mm. And, and the audience just there was a hush. It was like, this guy's the real deal. And, and, and he was so grateful to see guys come from everywhere to go to park city to, to, to support his nephew's film. Uh, I, I just can't say enough about him. If I had to compare him to anybody I've also met in the world of baseball, it would be Bill Ripken. Billy Ripken has that same kind of humility and he gets it kind of thing. There's no pretension in either of those guys. And they both just love to laugh. And, and but Kurt, he, he was just a joy to be with. Let's take a look at some photographs of Kurt as a minor league <laughs> player. The one on the left shows him with El Paso, which I believe was an Angels affiliate at the time. That's now, correct. Some people, some people might not be aware, but earlier in the 70s, before he got hurt, Kurt Russell was a top notch prospect, a second baseman. That's correct. Apparently, he had been told that he was going to be promoted to AAA Salt Lake City. He was going to spend a week there and then move up to California and be the starting second baseman. The night he was told of this plan, he was turning a double play. And I guess he tore his rotator cuff. And basically his, his first stint in the minor leagues, his stint as a legitimate prospect came to an end. Uh, he was a top-notch right. player, but he was able to muster up uh, the energy and get into shape. And he, you see him on the right with the Mavericks. And he comes back and plays for the Portland team. Um, that that to me shows you know some perseverance because by this time he's getting pretty established in Hollywood, but he's still taking time to play ball. Absolutely love to play ball. And people ask about the history of of, of, of Big League Chew and and uh, you know who are the people who helped it along the way. I mentioned the route Mount Rushmore and Kurt and Bing and Jim Bouton and the Portland Maverick bat boy, Todd Field, are the four people that made Big League Chew happen. And the Kurt th component comes in because Kurt is the one who convinced his dad they should buy the territory in Portland because AAA ball was moving to Spokane, Washington. There was a void in the Northwest League. And I don't think Kurt did that so he could have a place to play. I think he did it because he thought it would be a fun opportunity to upset the apple cart and be virtually the only independent team in all of organized ball. What a lot of people don't realize is back in the 70s, an independent team could play in the same league as the affiliated clubs. And Kurt was the mastermind. He's the one who figured that out. And so the family sat down and, and came up with it. One great story a few people know about was they're sitting around the dinner table saying, what are we going to call the team? And it's family and friends. And, and the name The Rustlers came up, kind of a Western theme. And, and in a, a, a rare moment of, of authentic humility, Bing Russell said, 
Rustler sounds like we're naming the team after ourselves and it's not going to work. I don't want it. And that's when they came up with Mavericks, which because he knew James Garner in the TV series Maverick and so forth. So it really it, it's just one of those little pieces of the puzzle that that, that endear you to to that family. Can I say one more Kurt yeah. Russell story? Sure. So I'm in my third year with the Mavericks. It's August of 77. I haven't won a game in three seasons with the Mavericks. So Bing says to me, before we go on the road trip to Walla Walla and Boise, he said, Rob, I want you, when we come back home, to pencil yourself in as a starting pitcher. I want you to go five innings and win a game because you never know what's going to happen. And so I did that. So I looked at the schedule and I said, okay, we finish at Boise. We go to Walla Walla. We'll finish that game at midnight. We'll probably get home at 6 a.m. in the morning. Nobody's going to want to pitch the next day. So I put myself in for that day. Mm. So we do get home at 6, 630. I had a small apartment next to the ballpark. I sleep till maybe two in the afternoon and I pick up a newspaper and a cup of coffee and I'm reading the sports section and it's grocery store night. It's Fred Meyer grocery store night. They're expecting 12,000 people. I said, geez, those fans don't want to see me. I haven't won a game in three years. So I go over to the stadium and I ask, uh, uh, I forget who was at the front desk, probably John Yoshiwara. And they said, Yosh, is Bing in his office? He said, yes. I said, I want to talk to him. He said, and Bing heard me. He says, that Rob, come on in. And, you know, a very garrulous guy. And I said, look, I didn't know tonight was Fred Meyer night. You got 10, 12,000 people there. They're not going to want to see me. We need to throw John Dunn. He just made the all-league team. Or Joe McLaughlin. He also made the all-league team. And Kurt, unbeknownst to me, was in the room next to that. And he walks in and he says, are you back backing out of your only chance to start? Are you are you you don't have the courage to do that? I said, Kurt, that's not it. I'll pitch tomorrow night when we get, you know, 2000 people instead of 10 or 12. And he said, don't worry about it. Throw five innings. We'll find a way. You're not going to embarrass yourself. And and so I went out and I pitched. And that's exactly what happened. I went out as the losing pitcher after five innings. I think we were down three to two. But the Mavs scored a bundle of runs. I ended up getting the win. There's a little tavern beyond center field at Civic Stadium called the Bullpen. And Kirk took us all to the Bullpen Tavern after I won my one game. And I walked in that door. And you would have thought I was Madison Baumgartner winning game seven in the World Series. Those guys were authentically happy. No more than Kurt Russell was that, that Nelly finally got a win. There was no sense of irony. There was no it's about time kind of thing. It was just, hey, Nelly, nice job. That yeah. I stuck it out for three years to get five innings and let the record show I got one W. And I think that season I was one and oh. So yeah. that's pretty funny. So, but that's the kind of guy Kurt Russell was. And 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 he and his dad were, you know, peas in a pod, just great, great family, great people to change everything for me, obviously. That Mavericks team in 1977 was a very good team. They actually led the league in one loss. And then uh, lost in the finals. Um, I can't remember the name of the other club. I was just reading it the other day. It's the um, Bellingham Mariners. Bellingham, yes. Very good. Uh, so that, that 1977 team, really good team. It's your final year with the Mavericks. It's also the year where the idea comes to you, shredded <laughs> bubble gum. Tell us the rest of the story. You know, it, it's... It's a preposterous story. I think it goes back to the Nellie Fox thing when I started chewing a lot of gum when I was 11 or 12 years old. And then being in the bullpen, watching guys chewing red man on their shoes, on spitting on each other, it was just kind of disgusting. But in 1976, a full year before, Bat Boy Todd Field, who's now a writer director in Hollywood, but at the time he's a maverick Bat Boy, and he opens a pouch of what looks like red man and he stuffs this stuff in his mouth. I said, Todd, what are you doing? You're 14 years old. He said, relax, Rob, it's licorice. I just like to make myself look cool. So we had the discussion about it. I said, do you think kids would ever chew licorice out of a pouch? And he said, I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. Todd and I had the discussion maybe two months ago. He, he runs a youth league program up in Maine where he lives most of the time now. And, and I said, when you and I had the licorice discussion, that was a season before I came up with the gum idea, right? He said, yeah. He said, Rob, I remember you came back the next year and said, I've been thinking about your licorice idea. And I think it ought to be bubblegum. What do you think about that? And Todd tells me 
And I don't remember this. She said, I think that'd be pretty cool too. But it was like three months later when kind of the lightning bolt hit my head when Jim Bouton asked me in the bullpen, do you ever chew red man? And I said once for maybe 30 seconds, it never made sense to me. And uh, he said, yeah, me too. Maybe an inning later, I said, you know, I've been kicking around an idea. Suppose we shredded bubble gum and we put it in a pouch. We'd look cool, but we wouldn't make ourselves ill. And Jim's eyes got as big as baseball. He said, Rob, I love that idea. Maybe a minute or two later, he said, what would you call it? And I remember my exact words. I said, I, I don't know, Big League Chew? It, it was, my brother Ed always says, it's like four guys in a pub in Liverpool. And one of the guys says, what are we, what are we going to call a band? You know, and Ringo says, I don't know, how about Beatles? Beatles is pretty good. You yeah. know, it's like you plucked it out of the air. And so Jim, Jim said the, the most important thing in my whole my whole history, I suppose, when I told him it would be Big League Chew, Jim said I could sell that idea. He didn't say I love that idea. He said I could sell that idea. And that was the difference between Jim Bouton and Rob Nelson. Jim was a dreamer with a deadline. I was just kind of a wide-eyed, long, blonde-haired kid just roaming the earth, looking for, as my dad used to say, you know, looking for a big game to pitch. But Jim was the one who disciplined me. He made me do things I wouldn't have normally done. As luck would have it, I found an article in People Magazine, a little company in Arlington, Texas, how to make bubble gum. I bought a case of the stuff. I went to Todd Field's mom's kitchen. Todd's mother's name is Candy Field. Let the record show Big League Chew was invented, created in Candy Field's kitchen in Southeast Portland. Mrs. Field still lives there. I get to visit her regularly. And she's as delightful then now as she was back then. So I went to Fred Meyer grocery store. There's that name again from Fred Meyer and I. And I picked up some root beer extract and some maple flavored extract uh, because I thought brown would be cool. And I made shreds of gum that we baked it like brownies and we cut it up with a pizza knife, a round knife and stuffed it into pouches. I had an art department make sample pouches. I sent it to Jim Bouton back in New Jersey and he pounded the pavement. Six or eight companies rejected them. Jim always loves to tell a story. He goes in, he gives his presentation. And one company in particular said, we don't make anything like that. And Jim said, I know that's why I'm here. I think you should. We got lucky. We found a small division of Wrigley called Amaral Confections in Naperville outside Chicago. They said, this is cute. We'll get, we'll give it a try. We had a three year deal. And uh, then it came out in 1980, 42 years ago, mm. three year deal. After the first year, when they, they had sold $18 million worth of shredded bubble gum, they said, maybe we should extend this deal. <laughs> you know, it's funny how that works, right? To put that 18 million in perspective, the following year, the Wrigley family sold the Chicago Cubs for just under $22 million. I remember calling my dad and saying, I think they just replaced the family interest from the Cubs to Big League Chew. It was mm. preposterous. Cubs are worth $2 billion now. I wish Big League Chew was, but I mean, it's just an amazing story. And again, it was Jim Bouton sitting in the bullpen in a Kurt Russell kind of way, just a curious kid. Being on the Portland Mavericks was like being at summer camp, except we got to play ball every night. We got to get on a goofy school bus and, and just go do what we did. One of the most symbolic things about the Portland Mavericks is the red school bus. <laughs> Kurt's dad, Bing Russell, found Gordon Erfer, who painted the outfield signs you're looking at there, that Jim Bouton uh, background there. Gordon painted all the outfield signs and Bing hired Gordon to paint the yellow school bus red and black to honor the Portland Mavericks. And I remember walking up when Gordon was doing it and I looked at the top and I went to Bing's office and I said, you see what Gordon's done out there? He says, ah, he's the Picasso of billboard signs. He's amazing. And I said, you got to come with me. So we went out to where he was painting it. And on the top of this red school bus is the logo that says, it's supposed to say Portland Mavericks baseball team, but it says Portland's maverick baseball team the apostrophe s was in the wrong place yeah and i remember bing he looked at it and he looked at me and he had this big league smile he said you know rob i'm keeping it 
I think it's better that way. So our banners in 1977, when you look at the movie, you'll see banners that say, uh, welcome to Civic Stadium, home of Portland's Maverick baseball team. It's like every mistake that ever happened with the Mavericks, Bing Russell found a way to monetize it and have some fun with it. Guy was a magician. Yeah. One final question on Jim Bowden. I remember the early 80s. Countless times seeing Jim Bowden on television talking about Big League Chew, promoting it, getting the word out. I mean, it went from being a new product to being a household name almost instantaneously. That's correct. Jim once said, when people say, well, well who created Big League Chew? And, and, and Jim quite humbly would say, you know, Rob had the inspiration and I was the perspiration. And mm -hmm. I thought that was perfect. Big League Chew would not have happened had not Jim Bouton been the bulldog off the field the way he was the bulldog on the field. He would not take no for an answer. Negotiating with Wrigley, uh, I had no concerns that anybody would steal my trademark or my idea because I had, uh, I had the top dog in, in the world of business. We were partners for 30 years. Uh, he wanted to do other things. I ended up buying him out. I really didn't want to, but he was motivated to do other things. So I did it. It was like a high-speed mortgage because I didn't want to sell the trademarks back to Wrigley. So I, I, I did a three-year deal, and uh, uh, I'm glad that it worked out for me. But I, I just had a feeling it was right around the time when the baseball strike was still having an impact on products that were baseball-related. And I remember saying to Jim, I know you got other things going on, but this thing is not going away. And yeah. he was just – he was convinced. He was the bulldog with his new ventures. And and so, yeah, we parted his friends. And, well, you know, the, the, the original character in Big League Shoe Now, Jim's gone two years now. But if you look at a pouch of Big League Shoe Now, his number is 56. And that's in honor of Jim Bouton because without number 56, uh, there is there is no Big League Shoe. Yeah. We've got a few items here. We, uh, we get buckets of Big League Chew. It's the official – a bubble gum of the Hall of Fame and children who come through the museum, um, at least when we're in more normal circumstances, if they complete the discovery tour, which is sort of a scavenger hunt of the museum, uh, they get a piece of big league chew. So we've got all sorts of bubble gum around the offices. This is one of your newer packages. This has the girl baseball player on it. Uh, I was reading about this the other day. Uh, this is, I guess, a, a young player. You know her, right? Well, I didn't know her, but she is the niece. It's a long story, but there's an artist in North Carolina whose dad played minor league ball with Cal Ripken through a friend of a friend. Her niece poses for it, and she's iconic now. She did, and it, she's now in the strawberry pouch. We took her <laughs> off the original, and we put her on, gave her her own flavor, okay. slam and strawberry, and it. we're just killing it with slam and strawberry. And the one small contribution, I did advertising for a long time uh, be between then and now. Uh, I worked with a, a sports equipment company, but in terms of my eye on things, I loved it, but I said, she's got to be left-handed, and we have to move the word chew over to the other side. And and rarely did we do that, uh, but there she is, and, and she looks menacing as a left-handed hitter, and it's uh, it's it's resonated well throughout baseball and softball you know that that you know there's no 11 year old boy says i'm not going to chew that strawberry because it's it's a girl on the patch it's just not that way anymore you know it's just it just doesn't happen and uh i love the fact that people have embraced it the one thing i will say about big league chew now it's made about three hours from from cooperstown uh i moved to ford gum 10 and a half years ago they're just outside of buffalo so I'm a transplanted Oregonian, but I'm a New Yorker deep down from community college to four-year school to graduate school, as are my brothers. So New York is a part of us. And the fact that Big League Q is made in Akron, New York by Ford Gum is quite fantastic. And these guys really, they respect the game and they respect the gum. So when we do projects, we always have both things in mind. You know, we stuff as much gum in the pouch as we can. It's made in the USA. The, the other two big guys are made either in Mexico or Canada. And, you know, business is business. I don't, I'm not going to tell them how to do their work. But when the opportunity came up for me to leave Wrigley and find a new company, 
Ford Gum was tops on my list, and I couldn't be more happy about them. They're just an amazing team that, that really get it. I've got a big league crew working on Big League Shoe. Just had to say that. And you're branching out into another area. This is the final item we're going to talk about. <laughs> These are New Balance Big League Chew Athletic Shoes. So we're going to open this up. And first thing we find is, well, it's not gum, but it's shredded paper like the gum. <laughs> but then we have green and purple baseball spikes included in this package. So here you go. If you lift up one of the shoes, it looks like there's gum on the bottom. Can you see the bottom of the shoe? Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> yes. Very good. How's this product? I love they put, for you? they put that design in. It was a fun collaboration with New Balance. Uh, the COVID thing kind of uh, derailed it a bit because we expected a much bigger splash. They're hard to get now because mm. the demand was phenomenal. The one thing New Balance did that really reminds me of working with Ford Gum, they didn't just slap Big League Chew characters uh, on a pair of shoes. We, they made premier shoes, baseball shoes, shower shoes, running shoes that are just amazingly high quality. And I'm, I'm just grateful for that opportunity to have that, that, that collaboration. Whenever I'm wearing my shoes on the street, everybody notices. Who's yeah. this seven-year-old guy wearing, you know, bubblegum shoes? It's, it's, it's pretty funny to me. This one has a flavor imprinted, Swingin' Sour Apple. That's correct. And Swingin' yeah. Sour Apple is that green flavor. So there it is. <laughs> Very nice. Well, it's tremendous to talk to you, Rob. Uh, just amazing success you've had with the company over these last 41 years. Uh, starting with Big League Chew, but branching out into different flavors and now branching out into baseball shoes as well. <laughs> it's been fascinating to talk about your eclectic career as a player, as a fan, an entrepreneur, and uh, still the founder and CEO of Big League Chew all these years later. Rob, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. This has really been fun. I uh, can't wait to get back to Cooperstown. Yeah, we hope to see you this summer sometime, hopefully. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. We thank Rob Nelson for being our guest over this past hour. We thank all of our viewers as well. We hope you enjoyed the program. Have a great day, everybody.